The following message by Alistair Begg is made available by Truth For Life. For more information, visit us online at truthforlife.org. Well, I said this morning that since I didn't finish, I would try and finish uh, the passage that we read. And so just in case you weren't present this morning, um, we were reading from 2 Timothy and from chapter 4, and we were considering the transition that was taking place with the imminent, apparently imminent passing of the Apostle Paul and the handing on of the baton of faith uh, to the arms and into the hands of Timothy as a young man. And the reason that we arrived at this was because, as I said this morning, we were thinking last Sunday of the last words of David as we found them in 2 Samuel. And we were considering in the evening the long list of individuals who were a vital part of the life and impact of David in his role as the king. And I think I wasn't alone in uh, finding that that was a recurring thought through the week, the idea that there will be a last time for every journey. There will be the last time that you put the car keys in your car. There will be a last time that you kiss your wife goodbye. I had a book this week that came from a lady uh, to whom I subsequently spoke in which she chronicled her experience of bereavement when uh, she, as a 54-year-old lady, had walked out of her house, leaving her husband of 64 uh, sitting in his favorite chair. Uh, An hour later, she walked back into her house to find him still sitting in the chair, but he had passed from time and into eternity. And she wrote in her journal of how this was a day that she never anticipated, she clearly had never prepared for. And uh, she wrote so helpfully that I felt inclined to call her and ask her uh, just the details of it because uh, I want to learn from that. I want to learn for myself. I want to learn so that I can be of help to others who themselves are, are facing bereavement. Uh, she's now 73 years old. That's uh, 19 years on from that day, and yet uh, the transition is still a very real one. There are all kinds of transitions in life. Uh, As I mentioned this morning, uh, there's the uh, moment when uh, the oldest of our children leave and we become empty nesters, uh, moments of sadness, moments of immediate (laughs) joy, and uh, all all kinds of, of bits and pieces, and therefore, Uh, What I wanted us to really come to grips with was the intense humanity and um, down-to-earthness of what is conveyed here in this section. That although, as we said this morning, um, that uh, the apostle's heart is in heaven, his feet were so firmly and securely on the ground. And his anticipation of what death would mean for him did not immediately move him out of the realm of concerns for the everyday events of life that had to do with his imprisonment, that had to do with perhaps his lack of inspiration from reading material, that had to do with his own experience of being cold and at the same time of being friendless. And while he would have been able to say that his best friend was Jesus, still these other folks were important to him. And that is why as he nears the end of his life, he's anticipating the company of Timothy and of Luke and of Mark. And it is in that context that he ends his letter. The way in which we considered it uh, was uh, very straightforward. And that's why we had ended at the 18th verse and with our time gone, we just stopped. His anticipation was that he had been um, protected from all of the attempts of his enemy, whether it was the Roman authorities or or, or others, to take his life from him. And he was confident that having been rescued, as he put it, from the lion's mouth, uh, the Lord would rescue him from every evil deed and bring him safely into his eternal kingdom. And then, of course, uh, he has this P.S. And immediately he goes on to say, make sure that you greet Prisca or Priscilla and Aquila. First of all, Priscilla and Aquila. I was thinking of this when I said uh, to Charles a moment or two ago, isn't it amazing how the providence of God works? That uh, those people who made their own determination 
which was presumably a prayerful determination, uh, now uh, were unwittingly making it possible for us to be the beneficiaries of his presence with us and hopefully of uh, the benefit of our collective influence on him. But it wasn't as a result of a thunderbolt. It wasn't as a result of some uh, amazing prophetic message. It was just as a result of life. And of course, you will remember that in the Acts, Luke tells us, after this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontius, recently from Italy, with his wife Priscilla. Why were they there? Because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And so he went to see them. And because they both were of the same trade, he stayed with them and he worked, tent makers by trade. And in that context, he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. And so it's no surprise that as he comes to the end of the letter, he says, make sure that you greet Priscilla and Aquila. And also, of course, the household of Onesiphorus. We were introduced to Onesiphorus in the first chapter when he had again mentioned the fact that he had experienced what seemed to be like a, a wholesale desertion in Asia, that uh, whether it's hyperbole in its, in its form or not, uh, it is clear that what he had been enjoying in terms of fellowship and support had deserted him. And he actually goes as far as to identify two individuals, Phygelus and Hermogenes, who presumably were perhaps leaders in saying, you know, let's leave uh, this guy Paul to his own devices. And then in contrast to that, he then introduces us to this fellow Onesiphorus. May the Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus. And then he tells us why. Because, he says, he often refreshed me. He wasn't ashamed of my chains. But when he arrived in Rome, he searched for me earnestly and he found me. So once again, here you have uh, Paul, uniquely gifted in a strategic place. And yet he recognizes what a tremendous benefit it was to him to have this particular individual uh, encourage him in that way. And uh, when you read that, and when I read it, it reminded me of just the importance of that kind of person. Indeed, when I preached this a few weeks ago in Keswick, when I preached chapter one, that is, I, I said, you know, every pastor needs at least one Onesiphorus, at least one. One's good, but at least one. And uh, a, beat on, a bee on me? <laughs> All right. Okay, thank you. See, that was a kind of onociferal kind of in intervention. And, and, and basically all that Onesiphorus did was he went to a great deal of trouble in order that he might provide a great deal of comfort. He went to a great deal of trouble in order that he might provide a great deal of comfort. Somewhere in my notes, and I can't source it, I have the record of a gentleman by the name of Mr. Smith. And Mr. Smith's uh, influence is recorded by his pastor at this point in history. And the pastor wrote quite a eulogy about Mr. Smith. And part of that eulogy reads as follows. A great blank was created in the church by the death of Mr. Smith. A Sabbath morning without his kindly visit to the vestry was difficult to imagine. He left behind him the fragrance of an honorable name and a cherished memory. The fragrance of an honorable name and a cherished memory. Onesiphorus is mentioned here in the PS because he lived so as to be missed. He was, if you like, like a character in uh, Middle March, in Eliot's Middle March that I quote often but purposefully, where in the course of that book, she writes, for the growing good of the world is partly dependent on unhistorical acts. And that things are not so ill with you, this individual, as they might have been, is in part 
owing to the number who live faithfully a hidden life and rest in unvisited tombs. Faithfully a hidden life and in unvisited tombs. Just in the same way as Paul writes concerning the body, he's very clear and he writes as somebody who is at the forefront of things. And he writes to say, you know, when we think about the physical frame of our lives, the real stuff that's taking place that is of vital significance does not have to do with our ability to see ourselves in a mirror or to fix ourselves from the outside, but it lies in the unknown but necessary functions that are hidden within our bodies. And then he says, and that's the case too in the body of Christ. And it's one thing for us to pay lip service to that, and it is another actually to make sure that we are acknowledging that in the way we acknowledge the gifts and graces of others around us. Greet Priscilla, greet Aquila, the household of Onesiphorus. Erastus remained at Corinth, Trophimus who was ill at Miletus. I want to make sure that you, Timothy, will do your best to come before winter. Uh, whatever, especially with the cloak, that would make sense. Relationships in the gospel for Paul gave him the opportunity to give, to learn, to tolerate, and to be tolerated. And they do for us as well. But what about Eubulus? Who, are, who is Eubulus? Eubulus sends greetings to you. Well, they would have known. We don't know. I can't find him anywhere else. And Putin's and Linus and Claudia and all the brothers and sisters. We should be happy to be included in that group. What, what part were you in? You remember that feeling at school when you weren't one of the athletes, when you weren't the, uh, the, the fellow in the, in the drama, when you weren't the starter, when they put all the names down, some of them went with photographs, and then the rest of us were just in the list. And then there were all the other students, all the brothers and sisters. And that's it. That's really it. And that is the point that he's making. I want you to make sure that you greet these people. They have played a particular role, but I want you to know that Eubulus is greeting you, and Pudence and Linus and Claudia and all the brothers are sending the greetings to you. Fantastic. And so he says, I want the Lord to be with your spirit and grace be with you. I said this morning, you know, we consider the blessing of restored relationships. We consider the peculiar blessing of gospel partnerships, and we consider the peculiar blessing of a gracious parting of a gracious parting. This is probably Paul's last written words. This is it. The Lord be with your spirit and grace be with you. And the you is plural, incidentally. Why would it be plural? Because although it is a personal letter, it was written in the anticipation of a public reading. He is writing to Timothy to be read to the entire church so that they might learn what's involved in him being a pastor and that they might learn what it will mean to support and pray for their pastor. And so well, the end comes. Uh, there is a last time, isn't there, for, for everything? And, um, you know, the, the old song by that guy who used to whistle from New Zealand, um, the first time that we said hello began our last goodbye. And that is, of course, perfectly true. It's sort of morbid, but it is true. So the first time I greeted these young men is the precursor to our final goodbye. And that is true for every one of us. And that's why hellos are so important. And that's why goodbyes are absolutely vital. And so he says, so let the Lord be with your spirit. When I read this, I thought about uh, Wimber. Wimber, the charismatic guy from the Pentecostal guy from, you know, the 60s and 70s. As someone that wouldn't necessarily be um, right on the 
speaking list for basics. Although I might have experimented, I think, but probably not. I preached with him once at uh, a conference in Wales. And um, of course, he was doing all kinds of, of ministry. And uh, we could only walk about 100 yards and then he had to stop because he was suffering from heart failure. And so I, you know, classically said to him, hey, you're the great healer. You know, how come you can't walk more than 100 yards? And he said, well, I'm not a healer. God heals and he's chosen not to heal me. So I was suitably rebuked. But the song that came to my mind was a song that he wrote called The Spirit Song. And, and part of it goes like this. Oh, let the Son of God enfold you with his spirit and his love. Let him fill your heart and satisfy your soul. Oh, let him have the things that hold you and his spirit like a dove will descend upon your life and make you whole. I think that's a nice song. And I think it's in keeping with what Paul was saying. May the Spirit of God enfold you. He begins his letter with grace in the second verse of chapter 1. He ends his letter with grace at the end of chapter 4. He takes his leave of Timothy and all who are the recipients of the letter with a parting blessing. Because he knew that Timothy would never outgrow the need for the Lord's presence. Nor would the people of God outgrow the need of his grace. And that's why, after all these years, so far away from Ephesus, we read this and we realize that the Spirit of God brings it home to our hearts. Relationships that need to be restored. Gospel convictions that need to be reinforced. Preparations for goodbye that are prepared for with a minimum of regret and disappointment and with a minimum of disgruntlement and a lack of forgiveness and everything else that goes along with that. And all of that in these last words and in this long list. This message was brought to you from Truth For Life, where the learning is for living. To learn more about Truth For Life with Alistair Begg, visit us online at truthforlife.org.